That what you think is a good thing and what you preserve as good and what you hold on to and never want to shatter may actually be the thing that needs to break you apart to an entirely new way of living, to a new dimension, to a new exposure. Hello everyone. So the reason I became a clinical psychologist is not just because I'm a little voyeuristic, but because I'm fascinated by the human condition. And what fascinates me is not how unique our stories are. What fascinates me is how predictably, ubiquitously similar we are. All of us are stories, really. Stories which hold the same archetypes, the same motifs, the same themes. And they all really begin, perpetuate, toxify, and contort into dysfunction, thanks to our lovely, generous, unconscious parents. <laughs> and when I began to see that, because you know when you're a new therapist, you're just so seduced by the reality television happening on your couch. It's so exciting. Oh, you all had a fight last night in the middle of sex? Tell me more. <laughs> and then you forget that you're here to help them because it's so entertaining. <laughs> and so for a long time, I felt guilty to raise my fees because I'm like, how much would I pay for a Netflix? <laughs> and then it, it realized on me that I need to kind of help them. <laughs> And when I began to help them, I began to look for the source. Where is all this coming from? So obviously, the first source every psychologist knows is the childhood. That's kind of easy. Books, tomes, theories. Freud has become famous because he figured that out. It all begins in childhood. So that's easy. But then what? Now what do we do with the dysfunction that you and I are products of? What do we do with that? So I began to uncover within my own quest, within my own spiritual journey, now what? So if it's in childhood, it's got to be the parent. But you can't just tell the parent it's the parent, because let me tell you, <laughs> there is no one more defensive than the parent. Even spouses, are, they'll back off. But the parent? I mean, the very reason we become a parent is to be the parent, to identify with the identification of the parent. And right behind that, in the shadow of that label, is I have to be a good parent. And that just means that my child has no choice but to be some sort of, some version of, some nuance of a superstar. This is my mission. And the parenting industrial complex, PIC, <laughs> has sold us on this mythology that we are some sort of martyrs and saints. You know, I often ask parents, especially mothers, yeah? So did you hear your child ask you to save it from the dungeons of hell that it was in? Did you hear the hearkening call saying, you, you, beautiful woman, with that beautiful man, you are the ones I want to manifest in form with. Because if you leave me here in the ether of consciousness, I, I won't become. You will help me become great. Did you hear them say that? <laughs> because we believe that we are doing a great justice to the earth by having these children. So then our mission, you see, because of this parenting paradigm, is to do it with zeal, to do it with vigor, in fact, the only reason we had children, we've been told, is to make them happy and them successful. This is what the complex tells us. This is what the paradigm has sold us. So in the name of that is great capitalism. It used to be, you know, just rugby around the corner, we'll buy a ball, we'll invest in a ball. But then the, the industry and the complex realize, you know, parents are a lot more afraid. Let's capitalize on that a little bit. There's a lot more fear to be capitalized upon. 
to make capital. Let's stir it up a little bit. Let's not just tell them that children need some activities and some degrees and some education. No. Let's keep churning their fear and keep making capital. And so here we are in this parenting paradigm of today, which is mostly capitalistic. But the one who is the cattle are our children. You and I were raised in a generation of benign neglect. Our parents really were self-absorbed in a different way, in a healthier way. But today's parents, no, 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 no. They're self-absorbed in a self-sacrificing way. No one is more dangerous than a self-sacrificing, self-absorbed narcissist. <laughs> Because everything that is done is not done for me, is done for you to be happy and successful. So in the name of happiness and success, we now have a huge problem. And it is a machinery that churns out children to become products, not humans. You and I are barely authentic, barely our true human self. You and I, with the benign neglect of parents knocked out on weed or just so fascinated with television that came out you know, when we were growing up or so excited that they had a few trinkets or could send you to summer camp. Though, that, you know, back then, we had parents who were around and they didn't look at us that much and look at how effed up we are. <laughs> Now today, children are in a petri dish to be made into some animatronics version of themselves. This is the plague of parenting today. This is what I see. So when I began to discover that the problem isn't just childhood, easy. Freud had it easy. No, 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 the problem is some illness in this parenting paradigm. There, there is great toxicity here. And unless we go to the root of this toxicity, which includes, in large, a great inner thirst of the parent, which is essentially unquenchable. If we don't get to that thirst, children will forever be sent to be prey, to be fed off to fill that inner hunger of their parents. You and I were raised knowing that we were not who our parents said we were. We know, that's why we're here in this room today, that we have to discover who it is we are, who we truly, authentically are. This is why we're here, we're questing, we're searching for something that was ours, our birthright to begin with. But because of our unconscious parents, we lost our way. Imagine today, Today, parents, with a zeal, put their children to be engineered in school after school, in institution after institution, in activity after activity. But the root of the problem is the same, cross generations, cross decades, cross lifetimes. It is this parenting paradigm that has at its core that children are to be possessed and owned. You and I were possessed and owned by our parents to some degree or the other. We were instruments of their self-absorption. Now it's just extreme, it's on steroids. Now it's blatant, unabashed. The martyrdom is, uh, is longing to be a pro, you know, prolifically exhibited. Facebook, social media, look how great a parent I am, look at my kid. Now it's just prolific, where before it was just grandma looking at the cute photo on the fridge, and you got to show off and say, yeah, my child. Now it's just on steroids, it's become insane. But here is the opportunity to see it on display. This is an opportunity. Just before we fly off the precipice and crash and burn, there's an opportunity. Just before this progress tips over into so much devolution, there's an opportunity. And the opportunity is to understand that the path we're hurtling on, crashing toward, is one of deep and dark destruction. Vishen said, I'm a little tad de depressing. That's why they put me on the last day. They had to put me somewhere. I know vision secrets. They had to put me somewhere. But let's put her early, where not enough people will come. And then by the end of the day, they'll forget her. Because I'm not here to win your popularity contest. Now they've started this, this braiding thing, now putting pressure on me. I'm like, should I be popular or should I tell the truth? I'm... I'm not here really, it's really not my investment to motivate you, nor to really inspire you. Certainly, certainly not to win 
your approval. I'm here to just tell you what I see, how I see it, after the decades of clients I've worked with, and the deconstruction of the human mind that I am endeavoring to pursue. The pursuit of the real truth, of why we're so fucked up. <laughs> it's not because we don't have a quicker brain, so we can learn some techniques. It's not because we don't have a better body. It's not because the, the best invention of Botox just hasn't come on the market. It's not because that's that beautiful person you could call your soulmate hasn't been created or birthed yet. It is none of those. The fundamental illusion is because we have been told that we need to become someone in order to feel worthy. We have to discover who it is we are, that this journey is to do more, become more, achieve more, perfect more. All of it is a lie, it's part of the capitalism. When you realize that we have been living in this bubble, it's a bubble. When you realize that this dimension is predicated on fear. You know, when I was young, I used to ask endearing existential questions. Some of them were personal, some of them were universal. The personal ones were, you know, will God know that I vowed to not suck my thumb anymore, but I'm still sucking it, and then when is the chariot to hell going to arrive? <laughs> and then I used to ponder other things, like why do I need to wear a dress? And why must I only have one boyfriend at a time? <laughs> why must I get married? Why must my brother not cry so much? Why must I have a religion and pray to this God? I want to pray to, with my best friend Amy's God. I want to go there. No, you can't. Why do we have to take care of our family, but not the family? And then, of course, very important questions such as, but why can't we have dessert before the meal? <laughs> why three times a day? And when I used to watch my father put his tie on in the morning with great pride and glee, simple observations of children, I used to say, Daddy, why? He's like, because now I look professional. Read up how the tie came to be. It's a sign of servitude and slavery, to be stiff and focused. So this matrix, you see, why we work five days a week and why we do, why we go to school and have to sit still, and admire and respect teachers who don't deserve it so much. Why, 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 I used to ask. Till one day I just stopped asking. Not because things made sense to me. Not because I received answers. But because I knew inherently that no adult had figured it out. Because they were living in the matrix. You see, they had bought into it. They were wearing it like their second skin. They had no concept that it was distant. It was something produced. It was something created. It was something constructed. We are living in a construction. None of it needs to be true. You know, when we name our children, when you're pregnant as a woman, you're asked a bazillion times a day, what will you name your child? Or what child, what kind of child are you having? Boy or girl, they mean. <laughs> and then if you're like, no, I'm leaving it to the universe, I'm leaving it to destiny, then they'll say, okay, what, what, let's just go to other forms of control then. Since you've given up that control, let's go to other ways you can control your child. What name will you give it? And just in that, oh, well, I want to name my kid something special, something unique, something unusual. Just in there begins the seed of endless, endless manic delusion and narcissism. Just in that. Now, you'll say, well, what do you want the parent to do? They live in a world of form. They have to call the kid something. But again, that, you say that to me because you've bought into this matrix. When you're married, you're allowed to change your name. The system has suddenly, miraculously, legally been set up for that expansion to occur. But you see, because the predication is that we own and possess our children, because we parents are in hierarchical superiority, we must give it a name. No one even questions it. Technically, if you really understood the nature of who we are as sovereign beings, we should have four, five, seven names at different times, and the system should allow for it. But the system won't allow because the system doesn't give a damn, because the system controls what it wants to control. And you just don't realize, I don't realize that we're part of a controlled entity. We are being puppeteered according to someone else's imagination or the limits of. You just don't realize it. So it is the way to be. So if it is the way to be and we don't question, then we don't awaken. So what does it mean to awaken? To me, to awaken doesn't mean to have a better body or a marriage that lasts 75 years or to raise the perfect child. 
None of that really interests me. It's actually quite boring. What really interests me is someone who tells me that they can see through the illusion of this dimension they've been living in. To understand that we've been all raised like cattle. All of us, we think we're so unique. We're really, really not. I'm so sorry. <laughs> You're cute. And you may be really witty and smart, but in our core, which is in the way we think, we have all been sold the same Kool-Aid. We've all been drinking the same juice. We are all under a hypnosis. We all are. When I was in India, I was certain that the air the Americans breathe would make them so much more enlightened. <laughs> Just a little disappointed. We are the same, yeah? Because we are living under a cloud of the same delusion. Now, there's no harm in living under the cloud. The harm comes in thinking that that's the right way to be, and that's where the toxicity starts. When we give to our next generation our way to be, and our way to be is heavily, heavily predicated on categorical duality. And if we can understand that, we can see how we've been set up to be anxious, to be a generation of great anxiety, because we have been set up on categorical duality. What is categorical duality? All of our life is predicated on labels, judgments, a way to be good and bad. We've been told since we are young how to be a woman, how to be a man, how to be successful, how to be a failure, how to be gorgeous, how to be unfit and not so beautiful, how to be happily married, and then how to be a failure. How to be, how to be, how to be, all predicated on conditioned duality. Mass doses have been injected into you. It's now in the way you think, the way the blood courses through your vein. It's constant conditional duality. Good, bad, bad, good. This is good, this is bad. And like puppets, you don't even realize you're being strung down roads. If it's bad, you go down this path. If it's good, you go down this path. But never do you stop to question what is good and what is bad. You never pause to say, maybe what I've been told is good could really actually be bad. And what is bad could be good. So in effect, they nullify each other. In effect, there is no good or bad. One of my first most profound spiritual lessons was to understand not only that we're living in a matrix, not only to realize that this entire construction of this thing we call a life is actually a ball of yarn. You pull one string, you see the fallacy in one area. You know, if you read the religious books, all of them have fallacies, but they're all justified and explained. I'm talking about my religious book. Let me just take ownership for my people, okay? <laughs> see, there's certain topics that are taboo. They, they, they prick people because we've been told what is good and what is bad, what is admissible and what isn't, what is appropriate and what isn't. And as long as we live in the fear and the clutches of the paranoia that we cannot speak freely, we will never awaken or evolve. So this ball of yarn, you see, the, there is a dangling thread. You just have to find it. But we're so terrified to pull. We tug a little bit, and life actually loosens it up on its own. But when we see it crumbling before us, we, we run for cover. We run, we run, we run. We're like, no, 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 this is bad, this is bad. Because life as we know it is life as we know it. So if life becomes life as we don't know it, there's great fear. So as long as we never pull, question, look under the rug, look behind the corners, look beneath the shadows, we will not awaken. To awaken means to look and see things as they really are, to see the source of where how you believe has come to be. Dare to go behind and beyond the matrix. So, so this is a bulb. It's beautiful, it's a symbol. It's a metaphor for things that are intact, that are perfect, made with exquisite invention, Without this, we cannot even function. This is a good thing. This is a beautiful invention, a, a mastery of creativity, an aesthetic and functional perfection, a maestro of its time when this came to be. And without it, we cannot function. It is a good thing in our lives. Now, 
There are cracked pieces here. Does it cease to be good? Does it cease to be good? Yes. We have been sold in a paradigm the truth that only things that look a certain way, that fit in our mold, that match our symmetry, that has been created by a template given to us by others, is good. If there is one crack, we deem it as bad. But let me tell you, inside here, I cannot expose the pieces in fear that I will cut myself. That the perfection, go break a glass at home today, go break a bulb at home, and see the pieces, each geometric wonder of shattered shards of glass. And then see your creativity to imagine what it could become next, what it could transform into. The possibilities are infinite. The sequences by which the earth, the ground, shatters the glass and the physics that allows it to entertain myriads of shapes in your mind is a wonder indeed. But we will not expose ourselves to such wonder, you see, because it's a blasphemy. It's taking something that looks so good to us and breaking it down. A man once won a lottery. He was so excited. He bought himself a Ferrari. Everyone around him said, you're so lucky. Who wins the lotto? You're so lucky. Women began swarming around him. Men began admiring him because now he was driving in a fancy Ferrari. One day he was driving, just innocuously, not so show-offy, but then he fell into an accident. He had to be taken to the hospital. Now people around him began saying, oh, this is not such a good thing. Oh, maybe, you know, if you hadn't won the lotto, you wouldn't have been in the Ferrari, and now you wouldn't be in the hospital. But then, that night when he was in the hospital, there was a strong gale of gusty wind, tornado-like, and it came through his hospital window, shattered it, and cut him in pieces. But then, it was a bad thing, but then it was so good because he was in the hospital. So he was saved. And then, everyone began telling him that, you know, thank goodness, actually, you were in the, the accident with the Ferrari and ended up in this hospital because this person, this doctor who works here, is really a specialist in sewing up the skin beautifully. And when he was introduced to her, she became the love of his life. But then on the way out of the hospital, do you want me to continue? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then they tripped on the, on the stairs and then they both broke their legs. But then, <laughs> my point is, is that what you think is a good thing and what you preserve as good and what you hold on to and never want to shatter may actually be the thing that needs to break you apart to an entirely new way of living, to a new dimension, to a new exposure. But because, but because we've been conditioned and you know, the tragic thing is we've been conditioned in such a myopically rigid, stratified way, at least if we were conditioned that many things were good. Like almost everything on earth that was good, no problem. Every life experience was good, no problem. But you know that only five or six things are good. Things that stay and last a long time, things that make us feel good, make us look good, and give us money. To be concise. Anything out of that is bad. So you and I, without realizing, live on the precipice of fear of anything bad happening outside those four things. That's why we Botox ourselves. And now we lift our butts and our boobs up and we take away all signs of aging and we never want to be poor. Your child comes home and says, Mommy, you always told me you wanted me to be happy. I found what makes me happy. And we're like, yeah, what? We're thinking corporate corner job, baubles, trinkets, jewelry, maybe she's going to marry a doctor. What, my love? What will make you happy? I've decided I'm going to give up all my possessions and go and volunteer in a war-torn country in Somalia, a part of Somalia. I'm going to go and volunteer and live on arms. No, my child, that's not what I meant when I said go find your happiness. Were you not listening to the other parts of the sentence or the other part of the lecture? There was a whole other section that you can't be happy without being wealthy. And you really can't be happy without being married. And you can't be happy without having children. I mean, this is what gives us all joy. Don't you see? The whole world is doing it. If the whole world is doing it, surely it means that it's giving us joy and happiness. 
but mommy, you don't look happy. Of course I don't look happy, <laughs> because right now, your happiness is my happiness. So it's only when you're happy I can look happy. So if I don't look happy, it's your damn fault. <laughs> but don't feel guilty. Nothing to feel guilty about. It's okay. When you're happy, I'll be happy. <laughs> Just be happy. But don't be poor. <laughs> and when you're happy and well settled, and you find your partner and you have your children, right? And the, the, the kid is going, I was so happy just playing with my blocks, but now she's told me when I'll be happy. So obviously I wasn't happy. So it's something else I have to look for. It's something so uh, ephemeral. I don't even know what it is because I really thought I was happy, but okay, because she's my mother and this is my father. I'm going to listen. So it's in the future. Damn, where is it? Oh, she's saying where? Oh, she's telling me. She's so loving. She's telling me where it is. I have to be well settled, uh, which, which to me, I think it means some big ass house with some cars in the garage. And then I have to find a partner and have children. And if my body doesn't allow me to have children, okay, that's not a good thing. I'm not going to be happy. And the person I have to marry has to be very well qualified. So probably I have to meet him at a very well qualified institution. So I have to study very hard, which brings us to today. I can't play with blocks anymore because I have to go work very hard for my future so I can be very happy. <laughs> I was really happy just playing with my blocks. No, don't play with your blocks. So this woman was a simple woman in a village, and one day she noticed a hole in her coat. But it didn't make her so unhappy. But then when she went outside and she met her neighbor, the neighbor said, your coat has a hole. And so the neighbor's judgment made her feel like, oh, okay, something bad, something wrong with me. Let me go look for the source. Sure enough, there was a mouse. So she sewed up the hole and she was like, okay, I have to kill this mouse. Let me go find a cat. So she found a cat and the cat was a good cat. They're good and bad cats too, by the way. And this was a good cat. The cat did what it was supposed to do and killed the mouse. But then the cat was not, you know, sturdy and resilient. It needed food. So she needed to give it milk. So then she went to buy a good cow to give it some milk for the good cat. And then the cow, damn that cow, it would walk away and like do things that animals do. So she was upset with the cow, bad cow. She had to do something about the cow. So then she bought a fence and she corralled it in a nice contained container. But that cow, so bad, always found a way to leave. So now she had to buy a cow hand, purchase get one from the market, a little boy. So she bought a little boy to come and help, you know. But damn, this little boy has an appetite. What, 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 what was she thinking? No, she just thought they would work for her in, in servitude and slavery, but it had an appetite. So now she had to go and find a job. She had to buy new clothes. And one day she, she began thinking, maybe I was happier with the hole in my coat. <laughs> so this progress that we're creating in the search for ubiquity of happiness, for the utopia of this place that we will arrive at, this tropical place called happiness, is the biggest lie of it all. And you can keep searching in the corporate corner office, in husband, five, six, in the Bentley, Keep looking, keep looking. Six pack. <laughs> keep, keep trying. And those in the one of the one percent will keep laughing, looking at us in this dimension, going, look at them. We've got them all fooled, simply because we keep touching the button of fear. We keep telling them, this is really bad. This is really bad. This is really bad. And they keep believing. And then they go looking for salves to make it good. Good. And we're so clever, we've only made four things good. Everything else is bad. And all the women who have dark hair and brown skin, we've just marauded them from inside. And all the men who are not strong and alpha, we've just killed them. And everyone who lives below the poverty line, like 80% of the world, we've just cut them off as inferior people, animal-like. So the truth of our existence is that there is nothing truly on the outside that can ever, 
ever fill us up. But then how will capitalism be capitalistic? Because with that truth, there is no therapist, there is no shrink, there is no pharmacology. There's really nothing much. It's the mouse and possibly some holes. But a woman who doesn't keep aggrandizing, collecting accoutrements like you and I have been doing, degree after degree, thing after thing, more things. This Indian couple came to me once. As I said, I can freely poke fun at my people. My people. This Indian couple came to me, very upset with their child because the child wasn't learning Mandarin. So I thought it was a new Indian language. <laughs> and then I probed gently because, you know, I said to you, there's no one more defensive <laughs> than a parent. And then the Indian parent takes it to another level. Because <laughs> our mission, you see, of the Indian parent is to raise the most compliant, perfect, fitting in the cookie mold child. We have been doing it for generations. We call it tradition. <laughs> We are very traditional. Tradition is good. This is what echoed through me. So you can imagine my plague of shame and guilt when I began breaking tradition. When I fell in the glory that I thought I needed to aspire, when I fell far below that pedestal of glory, when I kept breaking my own ideations, my culture's ideations of what it meant to be a woman, to cook, to be servile, to get married at a certain age, to not open the mouth so loud and so rebellious. So I asked them, Mandarin as in the Chinese Mandarin, and they were like, yes, because Indian parents are righteous. We're righteous. We have fully believed what we believe. We don't half-ass do anything. We believe what we believe. We're fundamentalists in our beliefs. This is how we raise good children who become doctors and engineers and spelling bee contestants. <laughs> the poor Indian parents are like, why is she after us? <laughs> as a symbol, as a metaphor. So they said, no, uh, yeah, I mean, yes, Mandarin. And then I asked, anyone Chinese in your family? And they're like, no but it will be the most spoken language. I was like, of course. And then I yelled at the kid and punished the kid. I was like, child, don't you understand? No, I did not do that. <laughs> but the logic with which we have created our justifications is our seduction, is our trap. We have made everything justified based on a conditional reality that is in this matrix. In this matrix, we have been fed a daily diet of shame and unworthiness, unless you do what the matrix tells you to do. And as much as you think you have free will, you know, when I go get a pedicure, I'm so excited, I can choose my nail polish, I feel so grown up, little realizing that the choice is already chosen. The choices choose me, actually. And most of us live our life like this, where choices choose us. Our destiny is mapped out. But yet we think we are free-wheeling, free-spirited, free-thinking, free-choosing. Yeah, we are, perhaps, a little bit more than someone who's really living in an enslaved condition. But we're choosing within the choices that have been made for us. You're choosing within the matrix. And even if you rebel, you're rebelling within the matrix. So you think you're such an anti-this and an anti-that, but you're anti-within the matrix that's chosen for you. So the only real wise choice is to leave the matrix. It is only, only when you make the decision. So when the Buddha left his matrix, a palatial matrix, he had every comfort in the world. He was a true prince. Every egoic attachment of grandiosity possible to the Buddha. And his people knew not to let this wise little boy out. Because if he went out, he would see the truth, just like the man in Plato's cave. He snuck out, he saw the truth. That's why our families keep us close. Don't leave, because you will find the truth. Don't go even to another house of worship, because maybe you'll discover more truth there. And don't call another woman mother, because I'm your only mother. And this is our family, not that. 
So when the Buddha left the matrix, one time he went out, and he saw old age, sickness, death, and suffering. And he asked, how is this possible? How is this an, a reality that I have not been exposed to? Where has this been? Why have, why have I been pillowed and cushioned from this truth? And they tried to hush him up, but this boy, you see, he was too incisive. It took him one trip out to see the nature of reality. And he understood that the reality in his matrix, in his palatial matrix, was not the reality. There was a real reality outside, not the one created by his people and his entourage. So he left, he abdicated, he absconded, he left, deserted his throne and went searching for the real truth because he, I, pro I, I project, must have decided, I would rather live in truth than in comfort. I would rather live in wisdom than be right. I would rather go suffer my own suffering than suffer a false reality. So he went out and he took a long time. First he joined the crowd of the other outliers. He joined the crowd of the other sadhus and gurus who were standing on their head and contorting their bodies, trying to find the truth of this reality. Mystics in decades and lifetimes past have been looking for what you and I are looking for. This is not a journey not worn by many, not traveled by many. So he joined the mystics of his time who were living on, on one grain of rice and he tried that and he tried to sit still for, for a long time and he tried to live on water and he tried all ways to arrive at his actualized self. But he couldn't because he was looking on the outside. He did what you and I have been doing, looking on the outside, looking for a guru, looking for a panacea, looking for medication, looking for something, take me away, show me the way. This is the necessary ingredient. The Buddha story is the journey we all need to take. We have to leave the comfort. We have to denounce the greatest stagnancy and complacency. We have to leave it behind. We have to step outside the two square footage of our belief systems to travel yonder into a space beyond belief, where you don't have belief, where you enter a desert ter terrain where you, somebody will ask you, what do you believe? Where you dare to say, I don't believe. What's your name? I, you dare to say, I have no name. What's your religion? I don't, haven't figured it out yet. What do you want to be? I can't say. If we haven't gone through a vast terrain of desert-like, absolute, terrifying solitude of the unknown, then we haven't really begun our journey. The Buddha's first journey was to denounce and no longer be the prince everyone knew him to be. What I'm saying to you is that the first step is you have to be willing to let go of your identities. Let go of your belief systems of what is good and what is bad. Let it go. Because who you've been given, who you've been told you are, the persona you're wearing, the masquerade you're living, you think you're not, you see? You think you're not. And you're like, no, not me. But you cannot not. I cannot not. Because I'm part of the matrix. There is no escaping. There's no one special person. Even the Buddha had to leave to go find. Even the Buddha had to abscond, be completely bare, naked, uh, starting again, de novo. This is the way of the spiritual warrior. This is the path to bear to find. You cannot find to find. You cannot cling to awaken. You cannot be the same to change. This is how we all want to change. They all come to me in therapy. I want to change, but I don't want to change. I want to change him. <laughs> change him. Watch how I adapt. Change him, Dagishwali. Watch, I will adjust, I will flow with the new way. Please change them. So everyone comes wanting to change, but no one wants to change. You understand? Because to change, even when you change your clothes, you first have to become naked. You first have to be bare. You, there is a moment before the next accoutrement where you are completely, completely shedded off your skin. Even in that simple daily metaphor, you go through the potential for spiritual awakening. But we lose it, we're not paying attention. We miss life's opportunity in its teachings. We're missing it all. When the infant cries and is colicky and is only pooping and peeing, it's the biggest spiritual invitation of all. 
to bear down to that level of complete non-verbality, complete nakedness. This is a being that is completely helpless, no ego, complete surrender, completely open, in the moment, with elemental poop and pee, showing us who we really are. But we miss that, because all we're thinking when we're changing the diaper is who they're going to become. And who they're going to become is of no design of the child. It is all a projection of our mind. Who they're going to become. We pretend and we sing lullabies to them, and in those lullabies we sing words which tell them, you have infinite possibility to be free, to become whoever you want within my matrix. Because if we haven't evolved, we can simply never allow our child the gift of leaving Plato's cave. So this is the journey. So no one wants to give up, because to change means to transform, meaning something in your form-based world must be shed, denounced, mutilated, decimated, done away with. You all want happy relationships. Part of that is changing your relationship with yourself. I'm not the problem, though. We all want to live in beautiful homes. Well, first you have to go out to go build the foundation of what that could mean. We just want passively. You know why we want passively? Not because we're lazy. Because we were raised to be passive, you see? We were raised being told the way. So we passively accepted the way. We went to school, we got an education, we just did everything on the checklist. We were passive. All of us were raised passive on a diet of compliance and servitude. All of us. So of course now we're passive. Now we want to change. We talk a good talk now. We're more smart, we're sophisticated, even a little spiritual. So we say, I want to change. But then again, we're passively wanting the change. Because to actively want change, you have to kill something in your life. You have to let it go with the brutality of someone who knows that clinging, craving, staying complacent and stagnant will not take you to the next dimension. Oh, I want to evolve, I want to elevate. Then the old dimension must die. That we don't want. Can we take them along with us? No, you cannot. This is the journey of the spiritual traveler. They must travel to new places and have new encounters and new adventures in order to learn something new about their new iteration. You cannot learn the new and the old. You just cannot. You can only learn the new and the unknown. But the unknown is terrifying as hell. So the Buddha looked and he looked and he looked. He kept looking outward. And then the Buddha realized after six or seven years, what am I doing? I'm projecting, yeah? What am I doing, he said in anguish. Where am I going wrong? But he was so wise, he understood. Oh, I've been looking. I've been looking, looking there, looking there, looking there for a technique, a strategy, a gimmick. All I need to do is sit with my eyes closed and enter my inner space. And then he sat for another, I don't know how many years, and did not move, maybe except to poop and pee, I imagine. <laughs> but he discovered that what he was looking for on the outside did not even exist. Not that it couldn't even make him happy, it doesn't even exist. You know, it's the, the emperor's wearing no clothes, but everyone is thinking he's wearing clothes. It's a complete lie, right? There is nothing on the outside to make you happy. You know, we've been told there is something, it looks like this, you just haven't found it. Until you do away with this idea that there is anything. It's not that you haven't found it, it doesn't exist. The biggest lie of all, and it's predicated on your fear of bad. It's all predicated on your fear of bad, because you believe you are bad. You're not yet good enough. You've been told timelessly, you are not good enough unless you find the it, the X, and the it keeps changing, and it's never good enough. It's never good enough. But you're just like so earnest, we're so honest. Look at children, we're so naive, we're so eager to please that we keep going, looking, maybe I need to be better. This is why this generation of parents is on steroids, because they're thinking, oh, the reason the prescription list didn't work is not because the prescription list is wrong, it's because I didn't do it well enough. My parents didn't spend $200,000 on my pre-education in kindergarten, but I can. I can. It's because, you know, my tongue and my brain weren't loose enough 
to speak six languages because my parents, you know, they didn't have the means or the imagination, but I can loosen my kids' tongue and mind by teaching them six languages. So I can do this. That's why I'm going to do it. Because I believe if the prescription list is done correct, happiness is, the, is round the corner. So when we are willing to see the lie of it all, that we've been told that things are good and things are bad. I said my most startling spiritual epiphany was when I realized there is no good and bad because everything gets set up from there. You see, when you look in the mirror and you see something bad because you've been told a wrinkle is bad, for example, or you've been told a saggy breast is bad, for example, or whatever it is you're looking at is bad, the C grade or the, the lack of funds in your bank account, whatever it is that culture has told you is bad, waiting for your fear to be triggered, now it sets off a domino effect. So in every area of your life, the first derailment occurs because you have bought into what is good and bad. The minute you buy into it, and we buy into it without realizing, we've stepped into the puddle, now I'm bad. The minute you step into that ocean of bad, you don't even know you've stepped into it. And you're deep under its murky waters, drowning. And in that ocean, now you start creating good, creating good. The Botox, the this, the tutors, the six languages, the harp, the cello, the violin, the sign language. And you just keep going. Because it all began because you entered that ocean. Now imagine if there was no duality. There was no split in your mind between good and bad. What if you fully understood there is no good and bad? That there, the rain on your wedding day is really amazing because the farmer next door gets to wet his fields and have a lush harvest. It ruined your wedding dress, yes. Not only is good and bad so relative, it truly doesn't exist as a concept. Because everything is essentially already broken. That glass is already broken. Life is already broken. We're looking for good and bad and making things good and bad because we've been told that if it's good, it isn't broken. That glass broke, not because I broke it. You put on weight, not because of life. You divorce, not because of your relationship. It's because the conditions for the breaking are inherent in life. The Buddha said life is suffering. What he means is the glass is already broken. This was already broken. I didn't break it. Things are already cracked. Everything is cracked, broken, imperfect already. The suffering is inherent in the life. If anything has been created, it has within it its destruction. Unless you understand this impeccable, intrinsic, intertwined non-duality of life, you will suffer. There is no such thing as something just came to be in that moment. Infinite cause and effect have been at play. That glass, when the, the, the man who, or the woman who blew it into shape, or the machinery that aggregated its chemical compounds into this beautiful symmetric shape, already knew while blowing the glass, that it's blowing the crack. The crack, however, will stay a crack until the right conditions of cause and effect do not manifest to shatter it apart. But when it shatters and when we die, or when we have cancer, or when we're stuck in the traffic jam, or robbed by the bank robber, we go, how did this happen to me? Because we are living in a conditional duality. We're good, we were, we were just driving, we were happy, we were so good. And then my goodness, this homeless man came from nowhere and I killed him, now I'm going to jail. Now it's bad, then it's good, and then it's bad. Because we constantly, without realizing it, are puppeteered by good and bad, good and bad, good and bad. Even the first seven days of this earth apparently had a good and bad. Had the devil and the almighty, even there, well, that's where from conditional reality has occurred. Duality has been fostered. Duality is the illusion. Because if you understood that the glass is already broken, you have already been dying since the moment you've been born. You're not going to die, you are dying. There is no, and then I was in a painful period in my life. There is no, and then I was rejected. And then I was human. In this human dimension, is the crack. You want to live? You want to live. Then be ready to understand that before you live, live, live alive, 
you must accept that you are dying death interminably. The glass is already broken. The breaking is not bad. It is the transforming. We are eternally transforming beings, here to evolve into our next iteration. How can we evolve if we don't break, if we don't shatter, if we don't let go? We wouldn't have the Buddha, we wouldn't have Jesus, we wouldn't have Muhammad if they didn't go out to search inward. This is the quest. There is no price that is high enough to pay for the prize of your liberation. The liberation is not going to be found from somebody on stage. It's not going to be found in the gym or in the clinic or in your relationship. It's only going to be found when you pry open the cages of your mental prison. The keys are in your hand. The door is already open. You just can't see because you believe that you are encaged. Thank you.